Okay, class, this is our first lecture in our robotics course. And in this lecture, we're going to focus on describing industrial automation, the different industrial robot types, robot configurations that we find in a manufacturing environment, and typical industrial robot applications. First, let's get an understanding of what automation means. Automation is the technology by which a process or procedure is performed without or with very little human assistance. It describes a wide range of technologies that reduce human intervention in processes and manufacturing. We're talking here about automated processes, right? So they can be simple or complex, but all of them involve little to no human intervention or, in, or assistance. Automation does not have to be programmable, and it doesn't have to be computer controlled. Obviously, nowadays, most automation is programmable and computer controlled. But really, automation represents anything that turns on or off automatically or starts or ends a process based on some pre-established criteria. So we can break automation down into three main categories. We have hard or fixed automation, soft or programmable automation, and then flexible automation. Hard or fixed automation is uh, any machine that's specifically designed to perform a specific task within a production environment. Okay, Typically, hard or fixed automation is not programmable. It's a very simple kind of uh, uh, device, right? It could be a, uh, a conveyor system. It could be some type of machine motion, such as a lever or an arm or a link. Anything that is going to be uh, custom made to perform a specific task within the production environment is called fixed or hard automation. On the other hand, soft or programmable automation is any machine that's used in automation that can accommodate a wide variety of product configurations. Product configurations meaning the products that are made through the manufacturing environment or through the manufacturing process. Flexible automation kind of works between fixed and soft automation. So it's kind of in between those two. So it can be programmable or it can be uh, not programmable. If we look at this chart, it's going to help us to understand where fixed, flexible, and programmable automation fits within a production environment. On the x-axis, we have product variety. This is the number of different parts that we're making in our manufacturing. On the y-axis, we have production volume. Production volume represents the number of parts that we're making per year. So as you can see on the top, when we're talking about fixed automation, we're talking about very few or very little product variety. But now on the other hand, we can produce a high volume of parts. This is because, this is because flexible automation typically has very high production rates because it's very simple types of automation. Okay, It's designed to perform a specific, highly repetitive task so it can do that very quickly. There is also a high initial investment for custom engineered equipment with fixed automation, but once that initial investment is completed, then the cost of making all these parts tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of parts per year is going to diminish over time. A good example of fixed automation would be a uh, injection molding machine, right? Where the molds that we're, use, that we're using to make the plastic parts are very expensive. They're custom made to the specific part that we want to produce. It can only produce that part but when it's up and running and after we've spent the money to create the molds, then it can produce tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of plastic parts quickly, rapidly, and easily. 
On the other end of the spectrum, we have programmable automation. Programmable automation is that automation which is going to be flexible to deal with product variety. So we can see here that we're talking about a lower production volume, but a much greater product variety. A good example of programmable automation would be a CNC machine tool. All right, CNC machine tools are used to cut metal in different shapes, configurations, different metals, right? So we can make a number of different types of parts. But because they operate relatively slowly, certainly slower than anything that is fixed automation, we can't make so many uh, parts per year. Right, so our production volume is lower. All right, CNC machine tools uh, have to have a trained operator using them. They are programmable. So they must be programmed with a tool path and a lot of other uh, characteristics uh, that are um, used in the machining process. We have different tooling, different setups, different work pieces. All right. So this would be an example of programmable automation. Robots are also an example of programmable automation. We program robots. They can do the same task over and over again. And we can reprogram our robots. Notice here that flexible automation is really in between fixed and programmable or hard and soft automation. So flexible automation gets close to fixed automation. There's some elements of a fixed automation scheme in flexible automation. Typically, there's a high initial investment in custom engineered systems. We get medium production rates. But there is flexibility to deal with different product variations. Notice that robots also fall within the flexible automation scheme, different types of robots. So maybe not the six axis and five axis robots that we might uh, say fall under the soft automation or programmable automation environment, but more of the uh, single purpose robot, such as a SCARA robot, all right, where uh, we don't have the flexibility in design, but they are still programmable. Examples of flexible automation and soft automation include, as I said, CNC machine tools, five axis robots, and SCARA robots. We'll, we'll talk about five axis robots and SCARA robots later on in this presentation. What's important to note is that flexibility increases as we move from fixed through flexible and then into programmable automation. So programmable automation is the most flexible type of automation. Likewise, production increases as we move from soft or programmable automation through to fixed automation. All right, so we get more production more production volume per year with fixed automation because the automation is simpler, it can move faster, it's custom designed, and we typically don't have to program it. All right, so let's move on to uh, robots. So what is a robot? Well, the definition of a robot is it, it's a reprogrammable multifunctional manipulator designed to move material, parts, tools, or specialized devices through various programmed motion for the performance of a variety of tasks. Okay, so that's a long definition. Let's break it down into the important features here. First of all, a robot is a machine. All right, so it's reprogrammable, which means that we can program it over and over and over again, and that's important. All right, it's not a single purpose robot where it can only do one thing. So we can reprogram it for different uh, functions, different applications. It's a multifunctional manipulator. All right, typically, and you can't see it in these examples right here because we don't have any end effectors, but the tool that is placed on the end of the robot is really where the multifunction manipulator or what we call the end of arm tooling 
or the end effector is going to be located. And this is where the robot is going to do all its business, right on the end. Like I said, there is no end effector on these. This is just the face uh, or the faceplate of the robot. There would be an end effector here. And end effectors are, come in nearly a, a limitless uh, variety. So we have vacuum end effectors. We have tools such as uh, drills or, uh, you know, end mills. Um, welding apparatus can be placed on the end. Um, sometimes we just have grippers to lift up different things, different size things, small things, large things. Um, and finally, a robot is flexible, right? It's reprogrammable and flexible, meaning that it can work in different uh, applications. So we can use this ABB robot right here. We can use it for machining. We could use it for welding. The same robot we can use for pick and place or for handling packaging. All right. So, so the robots themselves are flexible in their applications and their programming. And a lot of it depends on the end of arm tooling, which we can place and we can use different end of arm tooling on each robot. Another way that we can classify industrial robots is according to their control systems, right? The control system is basically how the robot knows where it is. And the robot, the robot control systems fall into two categories, right? The non-servo robots, where basically the robot doesn't know where it lives or where it's going, and it needs a human or some other, uh, some other actor operator to tell it where it's going. And then we have servo robots. Servo robots are a type of robot that uses a feedback system or also called a closed loop system to tell where the robot is automatically at all times. Okay. So a non-servo robot, if we were to think about what a non-servo robot would be, maybe it would be a programmable remote control car. Okay. So we can control the remote control car. It fits the category of a robot, right? We could program it to do different things. But at all times, with a non-servo robot, the human operator is going to have to tell where the robot is and steer and control the robot, all right? So a servo robot, like the ones that we use in our classroom in an industrial environment, uh, these robots are servo robots. These robots use this kind of a servo motor, all right, to control where they are. And basically a servo motor is a special type of motor that has a device um, attached to the spindle or the axle right here. And every time the axle rotates, no matter how many times the axle rotates, the servo is always going to keep track of how many rotations have been completed. And in that way, the robot always knows where it is. Other ways that we can classify uh, industrial robots is by their drive type or by their motor units. So we can have electric drive robots. We can have hydraulic drive robots. Usually these are reserved for very large robots uh, moving heavy equipment. And then we can have pneumatic robots. These are robots powered by air pressure, right? Hydraulic means oil pressure. Pneumatic means air pressure. Um, we can have robots that are powered by air pressure. Usually these are going to be smaller robots. Oftentimes the pneumatic robots are used in um, or need to be used in a clean environment, such as food handling or maybe a combustible environment because uh, electric uh, drives uh, are going to, there's going to be sparks involved in that, electricity. So that might be um uh, not a positive thing. Hydraulic drive robots tend to be very messy, right? The oil is never going to stay um, located uh, in the piston all the time. It's going to leak out and it's going to get messy. So, so we don't use those for food. So pneumatic drive, electric drive, and hydraulic drive. Now let's talk a little bit about open loop systems and closed loop systems. All right. So we talked about an open loop system and how an open loop system needs some kind of operator 
to, to tell it when to stop, when to go, or when to change. A good example of an open loop system is a, is a simple clothes dryer. Okay, so a simple clothes dryer is going to, let's say that it has a time setting, right? So when you want to go dry your clothes, you're going to take your wet clothes and you're going to throw them in the clothes hamper into the, or excuse me, the clothes dryer into the, um, the, the tub that's going to rotate around. Uh, we're going to set the time. Let's say we set it to 30 minutes and then we're going to push the button to turn it on. When we push the button to turn it on, it's going to heat up the heating elements and it's going to start rotating the the tub in the in the dryer after that 30 minutes is up the machine is going to stop all right so that doesn't matter whether the clothes are dry if they're still wet the clothes dryer is still going to stop after that 30 minutes so it sets the desired time and then there's no feedback mechanism to gauge whether the clothes are dry whether there's any other conditions that we want set, it's just going to be limited to the setting initially, which is what is the time frame? In our example, 30 minutes. It's going to run through that. And the actual dryness is going to be an unknown factor, right? This is not a very good clothes dryer. This is maybe an old school clothes dryer, but we can improve on it greatly by just adding a feedback element here. And the feedback element is going to work like this, okay? So here's our our old uh, clothes dryer. But now, instead of a timer, let's say we have a setting for desired dryness. So we can set the humidity level that we want or the dryness level that we want in our clothes. So let's say we want them dry, okay? Um, so we make that setting to dry. We push the button, it's gonna apply the electrical energy it's going to turn on the heating elements. It's also going to turn on the tub. So it starts rotating again and it's going to apply heat to the clothing, right? So that it dries it out, right? But when do the, when do the clothes stop, uh, being dry? When does the dryer stop rotating around and heating up the clothes? Well, it stops when the desired dryness is done. So there's always going to be a feedback mechanism to check. So there's a sensor that's going to be checking the clothes constantly. And it's going to be providing feedback back to the controller to tell it to keep rotating and heating the clothes because they're not dry yet. So it's checking this, let's say every 10th of a second, okay? Or every second. It's gonna make that check and it's going to go back, send a, send a signal back to the controller to say, yep, stay on, keep drying, keep drying. And then when the clothes reach the desired level of dryness, the sensor is going to read that level of dryness. Okay, the clothes are dry. The signal comes back to the controller and it cuts the power to the dryer. All right. And so that's a feedback system. That's what we call a closed loop system. You can see the loop we're talking about here is right there. And basically the loop is as long as the clothes are, are still wet, we're going to continue drying the clothes. All right. That's very important. This is how a robot knows where it is at all times. There's always sensors that are checking its position and speed making sure that it is moving as it's programmed at the speed that it's programmed. There's also sensors for collision, for uh, other kinds of uh, interruptions that may occur with the robot, all right? Uh, any kind of uh, undue accelerations or decelerations. So robots work with a closed loop system. All right, let's real briefly look at some pictures of different robots. So a hydraulic robot, this is a hydraulic robot. You can tell these robots are typically very large. Here's the hydraulic actuator right here. It's a big piston. This is filled with oil. You can see the piston uh, rod right there. So these are gonna be able to lift up very heavy equipment. Typically, these are gonna be kind of messy when they're, uh, when they're working in an industrial environment because, you know, like I said, 
it's difficult to keep all the oil in there. They get a little bit messy. And so that's why they're not used in uh, clean rooms or food uh, applications. Then we have the electric robot. So here we have the AC servo motor. Remember we talked about servo. So the servo motor here, that's going to provide that closed loop feedback system so that the robot knows where it is at all times. By the way, this is the robot. This is the type of robot that we're using. Uh, it is a electric robot. All right, so let's turn our attention to different robot configurations. All right, um, there's four main types of robots, four main configurations of robot. We have a revolute or articulated robot. This includes the jointed multi-axis robot, such as the five or six axis robot like we have in our lab. It also includes what's called a SCARA robot. Now, you heard me talk about that. This is an example of a SCARA robot, and we'll look at some examples, some pictures of those. But SCARA stands for Selective Compliance Assembly Robot Arm. Then we have Cartesian robots, which move in an X, Y, Z direction. Cylindrical robots, with, which move in a cylindrical path. And then polar robots, also known as spherical robots, with which move in a polar or spherical path. So the jointed robot, and here we're showing a five axis robot. This has five axes, so it has uh, an axis around the waist. So it rotates, it can rotate around the waist. It can rotate here at the shoulder, or actually the, the uh, joint two. Joint three is the shoulder here. Joint four is the arm, and this can rotate. And then joint five is the hand, and this can also rotate. So we have one, two, three, four, five axes on this robot, on this jointed robot. The work envelope you can see in the side view. This is the area that the robot can move the arm through without hitting itself. In the top view, you can see the robot can swing the arm roughly 315 degrees, right? This is about 45 degrees, so it can move through 315 degrees here. Each robot is going to be slightly different, okay, in, in its work envelope. Then we have a scare robot. So here's a scare robot. You can see it can rotate in three joints, right? And then it can move linearly in its fourth uh, joint right there. So we have three... Uh, rotary joints and one linear joint. The work envelope is much smaller. You'll notice that the work envelope is just slightly larger than the footprint of the SCARA robot itself. Where a SCARA robot um, gives up in work envelope, it makes up for it in speed of operation and precision. All right, these are very stiff robots. They're not flexible and they can move very, very fast as opposed to this robot, which relative to the SCARA robot, is going to be more flexible. Um, there's more uh, axes that we can move, and you can see also the work envelope is much larger. This is an example of a SCARA robot. So in this one, we're going to be the robot is moving these uh, these lettered discs um, through these three different stations, and you can see how quick it works with that. All right, so this is what a SCARA robot is used to do. Maybe from one station to another, it's going to move an, an object or an item, a product, or maybe from one conveyor belt to another, it's going to move very quickly. Sometimes we can put a vision system on this so that it can be a little bit more uh, uh, selective in what it's picking up. Okay, so let's move on now. Cartesian robots, their work envelope is a rectangular cube. Typically, we see Cartesian robots in uh, as a gantry, uh, an overhead crane, another word for an overhead crane. 3D printers typically are in a gantry or Cartesian robot formation where we have X, Y, and Z linear travel. 
Cylindrical robots, as I said, their work envelope is a cylinder, right? So you can see they can move vertically, they can rotate, and they can move this arm out to give it a different reach or a diameter from the base. Now we'll look at a short video with some uh, examples of different um, robot configurations. I'll move through this so that we can see. This is a, um, a Cartesian robot. And you can see in the application here, it's doing gantry type applications, picking up heavy objects and placing them on the conveyor. This is typical of what a gantry or Cartesian robot is going to be used for. Now let's look at the cylindrical robot. This has a little bit more freedom than the Cartesian robot, but it's still much more limited than the five axis or six axis robot. So again, we're doing material handling here, moving in this case, barrels from one conveyor belt to another. All right, let's look at spherical arm robots or polar robots. Here we have rotation around the base and shoulder, and the arm can move in and out. In this application, you can see a welding tip on the end, and so we're using it to weld um, this metal. Somewhat more restrictive than a five-axis robot. All right, and I think that's... So these FANUC robots, we see that they have yellow robots, white robots, and green robots, and they all signify different types of applications. So the yellow robot is the standard robot used in an industrial environment. Typically, these robots are going to be uh, electric or hydraulic. The white robots are the clean robots, all right? So these are going to... Um, be used for food environments or uh, environments that have hazardous uh, conditions where we don't want any kind of sparks, we don't want any kind of fluid leaking. Those are the white robots. And finally, the green robots are what we call cobots. These are collaborative robots. They're meant to be working, they're meant to work alongside their human operator or another human. Um, they have touch sensitive surfaces so that um, if they bump into a person or a thing, they're going to stop moving. All right, so those are the three types of robot colors that we have here. You can see some of these are hydraulic. This is a large hydraulic uh, robot, smaller hydraulic robots here and here. We have some, um, looks like spider robots here. These are uh, special pick and place, ultra high speed picking and placing. We have a scare robot right here, and then your usual five axis robots, right? You'll notice up here, this robot hanging along a gantry. This would be a six axis robot because the gantry motion allows it to have that six degree of freedom. Uh, this is another gantry robot. So maybe this can move along this gantry. And so we have six axes here. There are other types of robots than the ones that we just talked about. Uh, these special robots um, are, are uh, carts, right? Oftentimes, we call them automatic guided vehicles or AGVs, automatic guided parts or AGCs, also known as smart carts, and then sorting transfer vehicle, STV. In the application on the left, you can see that the, these are used, these carts are used in a automobile assembly plant where they're going to be moving the product along this uh, path here from operator to operator. On the right hand side, this is um, from an Amazon warehouse or Amazon um, where we're moving products. Uh, so these are the cars, these orange things on the ground. They move along this grid pattern that's in the ground right here. And so these AGVs or automatic guided vehicles can move, pick up these, uh, these, these product towers, 
All right, these shelves, they pick them up and bring them to the person that uh, needs to get the products out to, uh, to, to move them on to shipping. All right, and then they, and then the AGVs move these towers back into um, their their original configuration. So these are moving all along the ground here. They have sensors so that they don't run into each other and they know where they where they need to go at all times. All right, so robot working environments. Um, we call the robot working environment the robot cell, all right? This is, uh, so to speak, the office where the robot is going to be operating, all right? The robot cell is a complete system including the robot, the controller, which is this panel right here, or this panel right here, and other peripherals, including the table where the workpiece is gonna be set up, maybe a rot rotary table here, any other objects that are placed within the work cell. Ro robot cells are often referred to as work cells as well. They also include any safety features such as fencing, light curtains, and sensors. So here we can see a light curtain. These light curtains and the fencing are safety features in that if we break the light curtain or uh, open the fence, it's going to disengage the, uh, the robot and cause it to stop because we don't want anybody in the robot cell when the robot is working, all right, because that can be a dangerous environment. So. Um, the safety features that are built into the work cell um, make the robot stop when any of the safety features are broken, such as the light curtain or we open the fencing. So some typical robot applications that we use these five axis robots for, um, welding, painting, gluing, material handling, material removal, such as cutting, grinding, drilling, assembly and inspection. Remember that we can we can put different end effectors on our robot. So in this case, we have an end effector that's gonna be able to pick up this, uh, this soft bag, maybe a heavy bag, but it's going to be kind of a soft bag. So we have this special type of end effector. We might have an end effector that has an end mill on it or a drill. We could have an end effector that's gonna have a welder on it or a paint gun or a glue gun. So as long as we can change the end effector or the end of arm tooling here, then we can do all these different applications for the robot. It just requires reprogramming it. Um, a further look at the applications for industrial robots. Here we have the top 10 applications uh, according to motion control robotics in 2017. Palletizing, case packing, loading and unloading. Those are the top three. In aerospace applications, the number one is non-destructive testing and inspection. So inspecting um, the, the fuselage, the, the airplane members, landing gear, whatever, um, uh, drilling and fastening and welding also bring up the top three. And the top six automotive applications include painting, welding, assembly, material removal, and part transfer and machine tending. All right, so let's look at a brief video of uh, industrial robot applications here. I'm going to skip through this just so we can uh, get to a number of different applications. But here we have um, an arc welding robot. So you can see the end effector again is a uh, spot welding. Again, a rather large end effector on this one. This is, spot welding is often used in the automotive industry. Material handling is when we're just moving material from one station to another. Actually, you see in some of these, you might be able to catch some fixed automation as well as the robot automation. This right there is some fixed automation. There's a large hydraulic uh, robot, some robots doing uh, painting. And then one of the more common applications is palletizing and material handling. And then you've probably seen the automotive 
uh, factories with all the robots helping to put the different parts of the car together. And this is our material removal. All right, so lots of different robot applications, as many robots applications as we can have end effectors. All right, uh, brief video, uh, again, looking at the, um, this is going to look at some of those spider robots, which are um, for doing uh, very fast pick and place. Again, keep in mind that a lot of this also includes some fixed automation, flexible automation. So here we have a vision system that's helping the pick and place robots to identify some of the products that they want to put in the packaging area. You can see how uh, these robots now move. Very quick pick and place, very agile robots. Now, uh, note here the end effectors, these are suction end effectors. Again, some more end effectors with suction devices. Notice the fixed automation here, moving product down the conveyor system. All right. And that's it. All right. So um, that concludes our look at robotics and automation. Uh, the next lecture is going to cover safety features of the robot.